well, you know, this month I've been getting a lot of propaganda on uh, transgenderism, gay marriage, gay pride, all this kind of stuff. And I was wondering why I'm getting so much uh, propaganda. Well, June is LGBTQI month, QIA month. They keep adding letters there. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, what was once understood as common, common sense, a psychological disorder and a medically harmful behavior is now celebrated and a new code of ethics is being forced on all people. And for the past few years, I've, I have been stating gay marriage and the redefining of, our, of redefining of marriage is an attack on God's institution, the oldest institution, not created by man, but created by God, the foundation of every culture and society. And I've been stating transgenderism is attack on the very image of God. So <clears throat> dismantling God's institution and defacing God's image has very serious consequences for any nation or civilization. No nation has ever survived that has redefined the definition of marriage. And we've already done so. All right? And now we're proceeding to deface the image of God. So it's in the midst of this culture and the times we live in now that Christ Church must take her stand to defend God's truth in a culture that is quickly turning away from God and soon we will be reaping our consequences. However, many denominations have compromised the Bible's teachings to gain acceptance by the world. For nearly two decades now, many mainline denominations have been ordaining openly gay pastors and bishops. And recently, last month in May, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the ELCA, elected their first openly transgender bishop. The Reverend Megan Rohr will lead the Sierra Pacific Synod of the Lutheran denomination. So that's the Pacific Northwest. Now, watching the direction of so many mainline denominations and where they're heading is disturbing, and often it can be disheartening. And I wonder if the Apostle Paul walked into some of our churches, if he would recognize the message that's coming from the pulpits today. But we cannot be discouraged or lose heart because Jesus and the Apostles warned us of these exact things. He warned us that this would happen in the last days. As we near the end of the age, as we, return, as we near the return of Christ, these are the things they warned us would occur. And one of the reasons Christ and the apostles gave us this warning is to prevent us from losing heart when we see these things, but also so that we would not be caught off guard when these things begin to play, take place. So what can we expect as we near the return of Christ and the end of the age. Well, in 2 Timothy 3, Paul tells us not only what to expect, but how to prepare and take our stand, knowing what lies ahead. Now, first, Paul describes the challenging times ahead. In verse 1, he says, But understand this, that in the last days there will be times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. So Paul states in verse 1, there will be times of great difficulty. Or some of your translations read, there will be terrible times. All right, that might be a better translation there. Terrible times or perilous. Or some of your translations might read violent times. All right, that's connected uh, with description of demoniacs in the gospel. Right, so it'll be a time dominated by teaching <laughs> from the powers of darkness. And Paul describes the culture that was there in his day, but he says it's going to get worse. It's going to intensify 
as we near the return of Christ. People will turn away from God and you'll see the culture deteriorate rapidly. Now, Paul describes the character of the world as we come near to the end of the age. And many of these descriptions, maybe you're going, yep, hey, here we are. Now, there's 19 characteristics he gives. I'm not going to go through all 19. I'm going to focus on the first and the last. All right? The first one, Paul says, people will be lovers of self. Okay? We'll be narcissistic, self-centered, self-focused self-indulged kind of people, all right? And I focus on this one because all the other vices stem from this one, all right? When you, when a person's love shifts from God to worship of self, then a plethora of sins come springing forth in the life of the individual and in the culture. And if you look around today, we are in a narcissistic, self-indulgent culture. Look at the commercials. Look at Facebook, Twitter, whatever, TikTok, whatever is out there. What's it all about? Me, you know, look at me, look at me, you know, <clears throat> kind of thing. Uh, we are just in a narcissistic, self-indulgent culture like never before. And all these other sins stem forth from this one. And the last one, number 19, Paul states this, having the form of godliness but denying its power. So this will be the characteristic of the church, I mean of the culture. But as church history shows, okay, often the church does not transform the culture. The culture transforms the church. All right, The culture constantly tries to squeeze the church into its mold and that's what's going to happen in the end times. This is going to be a characteristic of many of the churches as we near the return of Christ. All right? Look at Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Of the seven churches, only two remain faithful. The other five are apostate. All right? The majority of the churches are apostate. All right? <clears throat> and Paul says, having a form of godliness, he, many of these are going to pass themselves off as Christians. They're going to be in the church. Many of the churches are going to have this kind of description as we get near the end of the age. And I've, I've spoken to many churches here in Hawaii, and I've been kicked out of many churches in Hawaii. All right? I came naively thinking everybody wants to hear the defense of the gospel. Well, I was wrong. All right? I've been kicked out of uh, numerous, numerous churches here in the state of Hawaii. All right? No longer welcome back, not even into the parking lot. All right? <laughs> so they have the outward appearance, but they lack the inner truth. Okay? And the regeneration of the Holy Spirit is not in them. Denying, meaning they den deny the biblical teachings outright, which is what we're seeing today. So Paul saw these in his present day, but he said it's going to intensify as we near the return of Christ. And in verse 6, he says, For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning, never able to arrive at the knowledge of truth. Just as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses, so these men who oppose the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get far, for their folly will be plain to them, to all, as was that of those two men. So there will also not be a decline in the culture and the morality of the culture and the church, but there will be a rise in false teachings. And these men will be in your churches, and they're already there. Okay, they are already there. There are so many uh, false teachings and apostate churches out there. Uh, it's, uh, I shouldn't be stunned, but I am. Every time I keep running into the teaching that I'm hearing, their tactic is to what? worm their way into homes and gain control. This is a, a dark, sinister kind of sneaky tactic. They're going to worm their, they're going to come in passing themselves off as believers and disciples in Christ, teachers, prophets, apostles. They're going to uh, <clears throat> and uh, worm their way in to homes, Christian homes, and into the body of Christ. To what? 
gain control, Paul says. And this word means they're going to see complete psychological and spiritual dominance over their victims. And Paul says, in this case, this specific case, he says, uh, the victims here are weak-willed women who lack spiritual insight and moral substance. All right? It's not a general statement. Paul's not saying all women are weak-willed. <clears throat> He's saying in this particular instance here, this is the kind of easy target they're going to be looking for. It's the immature, spiritual immaturity of these women that made themselves easy targets for the false teachers. But not only were they spiritually immature, they were morally compromised. He says burdened in their sins, whatever sins it was, gossiping, immorality, whatever it could be, burdened in their sins. They had curiosity. Okay? They wanted to learn about religion, but weren't really interested in receiving and applying it. So they're unable to recognize the truth. So it will be the spiritually immature and the morally weak that will make the best targets, whether they be men and women, for the false teachers to worm their way into the household of God and gain control. And he mentions here Janus and Jambres here who oppose Moses. This is from Jewish tradition. These are two of Pharaoh's magicians who opposed and competed against Moses. And though they did pretty good at the beginning, in the end, their folly was exposed and clear to everyone. And that will be the same case for many of the false teachers. So what will characterize the end of the age is a turning away from God, a self-indulgent, self-absorbed, narcissistic society filled with false teaching that will corrupt and threaten God's church. Okay? And that's what we're seeing today. Uh, a friend spoke to me. Uh, his son goes to a traditionally a historic Christian school on this island, a, a, a historic, a very um, high um, rated, academically uh, high rated Christian school on this island, historic Christian school on this island. And uh, his son and his friend were speaking about why they opposed gay marriage and the redefining of marriage and transgenderism when they were immediately accosted by the teacher, reprimanded and sent down to the principal of a historic Christian school. And the principal said, we're not going to have this kind of racist speech in our school. I'm gay. I live with my partner. I'm offended by your racism. You will not promote that kind of racist talk in this school. All right, so put an end to it. All right. <clears throat> and uh, they were ordered to study and to remove that racist thinking from their mind. Well, they came home completely confused, saying the priest, the principal, saying we're a bunch of racists. You guys are saying, this, what is it? You know? <clears throat> and there was a time when we applauded young men and women for their moral conviction and standing on, you know, uh, courageous grounds on their on truth and moral convictions. Well, now what is right is wrong, and sin is to speak out against sinful, harmful behavior. You know, back in the day, not too long ago, classical education or Christian education, it was really hard to get a job as a teacher because the teacher was not only the educator, it had to be a man or woman of the highest moral character. Because literally, you are not only the educator, you're the role model for the student. That's why it was hard to get uh, jobs as a teacher back in the day. Well, today our schools, uh, we readily hire teachers, administrators, leaders, openly <coughs> living in sin. And we are creating a generation of young people growing up completely morally confused here. 
thinking sin is right and the only sin is to oppose sinful behavior. So our application is this, okay? As we get nearer to the end of the age, to the return of Christ, the conflict between light and darkness, truth and error is going to intensify. It's not going to get easier. It's going to get more intense as we near the return of Christ. As the society turns away from God, it's like a downhill slide. It just picks up speed, all right? It's going to intensify. And so expect biblical values to be in open conflict with the values of the word of the world, okay? And it's just going to intensify as we get closer to the end of the age. So the Christian and Christ church must take their stand and remain faithful to biblical teachings and values, no matter what the cost may be. Right? Paul warns us, and we warn you here, this is what's coming. Right? And the situation will intensify as we near the end of the age. So in light of terrible times ahead or difficult, challenging times ahead, how should the men and women of God respond? Well, Paul gives us three exhortations here. First, he says, You, however, followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim of life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and suffering that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. In contrast to the false teachers who compromise with the word, Paul exhorts Timothy to live with integrity. Live faithful to God's word. And Paul says, not only you know my teachings, you know my life. Okay? And the word know there, all right? <clears throat> you know my conduct, my aim of life. Know in the Greek there means Timothy intimately knew. He had lived with Paul. They were on missions together. They slept together. They were in prison together. They did ministry together. Timothy knows intimately, carefully observed and studied Paul's life. And he knew Paul's lifestyle, his faith, his patience, his love, his endurance through persecution that did not diminish Paul's faith. It revealed Paul's true character and faith. So Paul's integrity was seen through his faithfulness despite all the hardships that he faced. Pastor J.R. Miller wrote, The only thing that walks back from the tomb with the mourners and refuses to be buried is the character of a man. This is true. What a man is survives him. It can never be buried. The greatest legacy you will leave behind to your sons and daughters, grandchildren, nephews, nieces, friends, will be a life lived with integrity. A life lived faithfully to the Word of God. Not perfectly, but consistently and with integrity. Think about it. The men and women who impacted your life the most in a positive way were probably men and women who lived a life of integrity. I remember playing baseball. I played baseball for nearly two dozen coaches while growing up. Most of them were awful. All right? I, the good ones I can name on one hand. All right? <clears throat> and I've met several great coaches or spoken to players who played for some of the best coaches. All right? uh, leadership is one of the things I continually study, but uh, I've met or spoken with men who played for Tom Landry of the Cowboys, Joe Gibbs of the Redskins, um, uh, <clears throat> Tony Dungy, and others. And one common thread <clears throat> all these coaches have, winning is not their priority. It's not their priority. Their priority is to create men and women of character and integrity. That's their top priority. Winning is the byproduct. And because they create men of quality character, 
they create a great team who become a team of champions. Okay? It's just a byproduct. But that's their priority because they are men of integrity, men of character. All right? And all their uh, players talk about that. And I remember, <clears throat> you know, uh, playing for some lousy baseball coaches and, and in, you know, baseball or any team sport, it can be very political, right? I mean, you can be uh, Babe Ruth, but if that's the coach's son or the coach's nephew or the coach's uncle's friend's brother's sister's son, you ain't playing. You're sitting on the bench. And many times the coach will ridicule and go after you to find the reason to get you on the bench or get you off the team. It's sad to see a lot of my friends who are good players leave the game because you saw what the coaches did to them. Because and I've experienced, you know, going up against the coach's girlfriend's son, uh, you know, and the guy was awful. But I wasn't going to play, you know, uh, and and the ridicule and things I got from the coach and things like it was awful. But there were some good coaches out there, and one of the great thing about good coaches, they have integrity, and that's manifested in that they treat everyone fairly. And they treat everyone fairly. The guys that work the hardest and, and are the best will play. And if you, work out, if you work hard, they'll find a way to reward you somehow. They will find a way. And that's one of the things I, I asked about Tom Landry and Joe Gibbs and all these guys. The players said they were fair men. It didn't matter if you were the superstar or second string. They treated you fairly. And if you were out of line, even if you were the superstar, all right, you sat on the bench. Or you got, if you, and he gave you multiple chances. And if you didn't shape up, I don't care if you were the superstar of the team, you were traded. All right, he treated everyone fairly. I remember playing for Coach Dave. And he had a tremendous reputation of being one of the best coaches on the island. So it was great to play for him. And that's what he told us first day of practice. He said, winning is not my priority. My priority is to build men and women of character. And that's what he did. And his son was the catcher, an all-star catcher on our team. But there was another guy who played catcher who came on the scene. And he was obviously better than the coach's son at catcher. And, you know... As the season was about to begin, we went out and said, Mike, man, you better learn another position, right field or first base or something, because coach's son, you ain't catching, man. He said, yeah, I know. Uh, well, first game there, <clears throat> Coach Dave announced the lineup, and Mike was the catcher, and his son was on the bench. We were absolutely stunned. He treated everyone equally. The best guys played those who worked out hard, he found a way to reward you. You know, and we all admired the coach. He, we played our heart out for the guy, okay, because we respected him. And uh, whenever he told you to do something, it's, yes, sir. Okay, not because we were intimidated or scared of him, but because we knew he was a man of integrity. Okay, that's the power of integrity. Right? He treated all of us fairly, right? <clears throat> now, his son did make the all-star team as a backup. We'll... we'll Cut him slack for that. <laughs> hey, but uh, uh, I remember that example. It's always stuck with me. So when I was a pastor, I tried to treat everyone fairly. Okay? Uh, whether you are a big giver, you are a no giver, you know, deacon, whatever, I tried to treat everyone. It's fairly, I didn't, I'm not as good as Coach Dave was, not even close, but I tried to. Uh, at evidence and answers, you know, whether you're a big donor, big supporter, I, I try to treat everyone fairly. Um, and in my, at, the, at Pac Rim University there where I teach, you know, there's some students I connect more who are much more interested in my class than others, but I try to treat everyone fairly. You know, those that are struggling, I, I want to give them uh, more time to catch up to speed uh, instead of just hanging out with the gifted, very interested students. All the, I try to be as fair as I can. I don't do it as well, but I do it because I remember the example of Coach Dave. Though he's long gone, uh, his motto remains. And that's what Paul says to Timothy. You live with integrity. Remember my example. And we all should be able, hopefully someday, to say that to our children, our nieces, our nephews, our students, and our friends. 
So our application <clears throat> is to live with integrity. Live faithful to God's word. You're, you're not going to do it perfectly, but try to do it consistently as you can. Guard your integrity, right? Never compromise it. It's going to get much, much harder to do as we get, as the society around us surrenders their integrity, embraces false ideologies and false lifestyles to stand and live with integrity and faithfulness to God's word. The second way we're to stand firm, Paul says, is to endure persecution. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ, Jesus, will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned. You have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. So Paul exhorts Timothy to endure persecution. Everyone who's going to stand for light in a world of darkness is going to face opposition. Everyone who's going to live truth in a world that's embracing falsehood is going to experience uh, confrontation here. And in the last days, Paul says the situation is going to get a lot more intense. Right? You're going to see clear lines between light and darkness, good and evil, truth and error. Because he says false teaching will increase as evil men and imposters go from bad to worse. All right? You're going to see a lot more false teachings and false teachers. You know, conduct. We knew, you know, just maybe a decade ago was mentally, um, you know, was a psychological disorder is now embraced as normal. And it's a psychological disorder to, have, to speak out in opposition to that kind of behavior. And it's going to get tougher to maintain our faith as individual Christians and as a church of Christ as the culture continues to turn away from God and go on that downhill slide. You know, now in our public schools, okay, especially here in the state of Hawaii, if a child elementary school child comes up to a teacher or a counselor and says, you know, a boy says, I think I'm a girl. Can I start the gender transformation process? A teacher or counselor cannot say no. And I say, whoa, let's back it up here. What's your biology say? What's reality say here? You can't. You cannot speak out. You cannot. You have to allow that gender transition to start taking place. And you don't have to tell the parents. Okay, but you can start that whole process. <clears throat> and uh, I was speaking in Dallas a couple weeks ago via Zoom. So I was up at 3 in the morning speaking at their conference on transgenderism. And one of the teachers, you know, raised their hand at the Q&A time and said, I'm a teacher and that is the policy in our school. If a child comes and says, you know, I am, is a boy and says, I'm a girl, or if a girl says, I think I'm a boy, and they want to start the gender transition process, we cannot speak out against it. We cannot. All right? We have to allow it. And call them by their preferred gender. All right? If it's a boy and wants to be called she, we call her she, vice versa. She said, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And I said, well, this is where Christ talks about, if you want to be my disciple, die to yourself, take up your cross, Come follow me. I said, this is uh, what he talked about here in Timothy. This is where the Christian church has to take your stand. I said, go up to the board and say, this is my position. Truth is what corresponds to reality. I cannot lie to this child. It, we all know it is psychologically harmful. It is medically harmful. It is physically harmful. It is dangerous to teach children Truth is what I create in my mind. All right? Truth is what's out here. Truth is outside of us. We conform to it. Biblical definition of truth, the traditional philosophical definition of truth is what corresponds to reality. It matches reality. Okay? <clears throat> this is a white flower. 
It's not purple. It's not black. It's not whatever I imagine in my mind. I see it corresponds, and I conform to what reality is. Okay? I can sincerely believe this is a black rose all I want. But it doesn't become a black rose. But in the gender debate, it does. Reality conforms to whatever I imagine here. All right? Now, I can imagine I'm a six foot five black man. But everyone will look at you and say, that's not reality. But if I come to you and say, I'm a woman, they'll say, well, okay, that's reality. You know, I mean, it's absurd. It's nuts. All right? But that's what we are believing. And anyway, I told her, I said, this is where you got to take your stand. Okay? Truth is what corresponds. You can't lie to these kids. It's medically harmful, psychologically. And she said, I'll get fired. And I said, that's what Christ talks about when he says, uh, to carry a cross and follow him. You cannot be so in love with the world, our jobs, being accepted by the world, that we're willing to compromise God's truth and our core convictions just to hold on to a job. And she kind of looked, and I said, and you never know what God's going to do. You never know what God, when you take your stand for Christ. You never know. I said, courage inspires courage. You might inspire the other Christian teachers to step up and say, hey, wait a minute, us too. We're with her. I said, you never know. At this board meeting, the parents might step up and say, wait a minute, is that what you're teaching our kids? We don't want that. We want her, and we want teachers like her. All right? I said, you never know what God's going to do. But if you compromise your core convictions, remain silent, and just go along, you don't give God an opportunity to do anything. You know? <clears throat> may not turn out as you expect. You may get fired. But that's where you've got to trust God. Maybe he'll provide a job at a Christian school, a Catholic school, maybe another school. All right, but nothing's going to happen if you compromise your convictions and the truth and just go along and conform. Nothing's going to, nothing good's going to come out of that. All right, so <clears throat> be interesting to see what she, she did, but hopefully more teachers like Travis will be standing up for truth, you know, and God's word, being men and women of integrity. So our life lesson is this. We cannot be so in love with the world, right? with this world, with our job, of being accepted, of our status, that we're willing to compromise on God's truth and our very core convictions. And you can endure persecution if your eyes are fixed on eternity. And we are not in love so much with this world. We have to learn to love eternity more than... We love this world. That's what the Bible teaches us. Now, the third way, Paul says, is to value God's word. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, the scriptures, for which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, Paul says here, continue in the things you have learned. Hold on to, remain faithful to what you have learned. Because the scriptures, he says, make you wise unto salvation. In other words, how you respond to God's inspired word here determines your life now, whether you're going to live according to truth or what is false, and it's going to determine your eternal destiny. And it's crucial it's essential in a believer's life because this scripture, Paul says, is God-breathed. Okay? And he says, all scripture is God-breathed. Now, many scholars say all scripture refers only to the Old Testament. All right? But I'm going to say that it also applies to the New Testament as well, the writings of the apostles. How do we know that? Well, we know because in the New Testament, the apostles knew when they were writing inspired scripture. How do we know that? Well, 1 Timothy 5.18, Paul quotes the gospel of Luke, and he calls Luke's gospel scripture. Okay? 1 Timothy 5.18, he quotes from Deuteronomy, and he quotes, from script, uh, he quotes from Luke's gospel. And he says, scripture says, and he calls them both scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, Peter calls Paul's writings Holy Scripture. 
All right, so the apostles knew when they were writing inspired, inerrant, uh, the word of God. So when Paul writes here in Timothy, all scripture, I believe he's referring not only to the Old Testament, but to the writings of the apostles. And he says, it's God breathed, theop noustos, the very breath of God. It is sourced from God. You know, when we breathe on a mirror, you get fog. When God breathed through his writers, we have the word of God. And skeptics often argue, they say the Bible is a human book written by human authors, and so it has errors. How can it be divinely inspired? Well, it's men and women inspired by God who communicated the inerrant, inspired word of God. And Paul says it's useful for all areas of Christian living, for teaching. It's the source of truth, provides the right worldview in which to live in God's world and interpret all of life and the world and our experiences around us. Right? So due to the rapid spread of false teaching, he emphasized the importance here of sound teaching. Rebuking. It's the process of making someone aware of sin to produce self-awareness of sin. <clears throat> Correction. Helping individuals set straight their doctrine and their beliefs and to correct them from sin to restore someone to right standing and fellowship with God. And training in righteousness means moral training and discipline to lead someone to the path of truth and righteousness. So to sum it up, doctrine is to keep us from error, reproof to keep us from sin, correction to keep us from failure, training in righteousness to keep us from foolishness. Okay, to think correctly, be, that's what begins, and then we can live truthfully and righteously. And living with wisdom comes from knowing and applying God's truth. There is no shortcut. It is the responsibility of every Christian and disciple of Christ to study deeply and to know the Word of God. It's the responsibility of every believer in Christ. The Cultural Research Center did a recent study uh, just this past year, massive study. And what they discovered was once again disheartening and close to shocking. In a time when we have more access to Bibles and Bible tools than ever before, only 20% of, Christ, of evangelical Christians have a biblical worldview. That means 80% of the evangelical church thinks like the culture, just like the culture, and not like Christ. <laughs> when it comes to the mainline big denominations, less than 10% have a biblical worldview. And when it came to the United States now, Americans... Less than 6% of Americans have a biblical worldview. That's a drop of 50% over the last 25 years. And that one is on us. That's our fault. How can non-believers in our country think biblically or have biblical values when the vast majority of Christ's church doesn't have biblical values? What example do they have to look at? What teachings do they have to hear? Where's truth going to come from if 90% of us don't even think just like the culture? Where are they going to look to? That drop in biblical values and a biblical worldview among our nation, that belongs to us. Okay, That's our fault. Christ Church, we have got to get our act together. We have got to get into the Word and study the Word and apply the Word and understand what it means to build a Christian worldview and have a Christian worldview and to be able to articulate it and defend it and present it in the culture where God has called you, right? Whether it be in you're, you're working in the areas of environment, science, education, government, business, 
Uh, we're to present God's truth in all of those arenas. And if you understand a Christian worldview, you can do so. That's what evidence and answers is all about. So our life application is this. Every Christian must study the Word of God diligently, individually, and together as believers in Christ. That's why churches like this, when I hear of Bible study groups all over the place, and Christians studying the Word, uh, that's fantastic. It's going to become more and more rare as we, return, as we get closer to the return of Christ. So we need to understand the times that we live in and our calling now as disciples of Christ. So although we face difficult and challenging times ahead, remember, God doesn't need much to do something great. He can take just one person or a few and do something magnificent. <clears throat> and let us also remember God is in control and what we're seeing reminds us that the king is coming. So let us be found faithful, standing firm, living with integrity, enduring the persecution and conflict that will be coming and being faithful to his word.